You lost both teams? Get a grip on this operation, Heather. That's boring. Green light the asset. Sir, I need more time. We have no time. Are you going to give that order or not? Sir, please. You are too naive to see the truth. There's no bringing in born. We will defend these police officers. Listen to police officers' commands, listen to what we tell you, and just stop. The nation needs to realize that when we tell you to do something, do it. And if you're wrong, you're wrong. If you're right, then the courts will figure it out. We don't get to pick the law. We enforce them. But at the end of the day, each and every member is to go home safe. Sometimes the use of force is necessary. You need to comply with the police officer the way the system was meant to be. Comply with the orders of police officers. Resisting arrest is a real and dangerous crime. Nonpartisan Liberty for All. I'm your host, Dave Bourne, and it is September 15th, 2016, and we are coming to you live from Las Vegas, Nevada. Thank you for tuning in to Nonpartisan Liberty for All. We're on weeknights, Tuesday through Thursday at 7 o'clock Pacific, 10 o'clock Eastern, and you can listen live on Spreaker.com and NonpartisanLibertyForAll.com. And to the archives immediately following the show, on Spreaker, YouTube, Twitter, Tumblr, SoundCloud, Stitcher, and iTunes. On Nonpartisan Liberty for All, we promote self-ownership and the ideas of true freedom and liberty, meaning being able to do whatever you want as long as you respect the freedom of others and don't directly interfere with their freedom, exposing government for what it is, a mafia based on extortion that rules without consent, by threat of force and violence. And we, of course, are always happy to hear from you. You can reach us via phone at 702-470-7664. That's 702-470-7664. Or via Skype at Nonpartisan Liberty for All. Uh, You can send a uh, user uh, request and... We will uh, with just your name and what you want to talk about, and we will bring you on the air. And definitely check us out at nonpartisanlibertyforall.com, which has all the contact information. So if you missed a number or the Skype uh, username, you can find those as well as other contact information, articles and blogs, archives, and all other types of stuff. Links to our Facebook pages and other social media. So... We're in the middle of a two-part special on the Iran-Contra hearings and MENA, Arkansas, uh, which we didn't really start to get into. Yesterday, we left off at Barry Seal, whose story uh, has been made into two movies. I... Ended up seeing the first one, which was a bunch of fucking garbage. It didn't really go into the true life of Barry Seal. It took one part of just an incident where he was finally charged with something and then the aftermath of that and working for the DEA. And a couple things were, I mean, it was somewhat true what happened but it's like taking a tiny part out of somebody's life and leaving everything else out you know and at the same time they kind of lied because they didn't say anything about him being an actual uh cia agent and he was more of a cia agent it turns out than a drug smuggler that he was smuggling drugs for the CIA is what I got from the information that I had uh, heard. And it was from multiple sources, not that I talked to the sources, but I mean, from the 
multiple documentaries and one was actually a book that they uh read on youtube they read the barry seal chapter on youtube and that goes into a lot of detail about his his cia involvement even going back to his early 20s saying that he was working for the cia back then so that kind of totally destroys one that movie and the whole narrative about Barry Seal that he was just they they want you to think he was like a drug smuggler who the CIA said, "Oh, do you want to uh fly um what do you call it? uh weapons to the contras for us." Cuz in the movie he wasn't even flying weapons. He was just flying cocaine. So it didn't even get into that. It, it was it was a propaganda fucking movie, and they're coming out with another one. They have changed the name, I just found out. It was called Mina. Now it's called American... Fuck. American something. And I don't like the fact that they're changing the name. It should be Mina, because that links it directly to Arkansas and fucking Bill Clinton. And the fact that a guy like Bill Clinton, and we're going to get into the shit that he did uh, today, but the fact that he can be involved in all this stuff, and he was involved in Iran-Contra, he was involved in bringing back cocaine. Um, The only reason he was involved is because what happened was, and we'll get into the details of this, but to give you a summary before we do, is that he was the governor of Arkansas and they chose to use the airport in a town called Mina, which has a population of about 5,000, some small uh, town in Arkansas. And that's why he got involved in that. But I mean, Bill Clinton was involved in a lot, whole lot of other shit that I'm not even going to bring up. I mean, never mind all the sex scandals, which to be honest, I don't really give a fuck about. I don't. I I don't care if he was cheating on his wife and who he was cheating with. The only thing that bothers me is that if you're a governor and you're using your power as a governor to get girls jobs that will fuck you, that's not right. Um, If you have your own business, I don't think there's anything wrong with it. But if you're part of government and the same thing with Lewinsky, My only issue with that whole thing was just that she was an intern. Besides that, I could have cared less. If if he had an affair with somebody else, even in the White House, um, you know, there's that power thing that he's the president. And if it was somebody working for him, you really shouldn't be doing that because they feel the pressure in their job that they have to do it. But I mean, Monica Lewinsky seemed like she did it willingly and didn't have any problem like, hey, I'll fuck the president. And she was already an intern. And I don't think she ended up getting anything out of it, to be honest. Um, She was an intern already and maybe she got some perks out of her job. But, you know, I just think it's wrong to have sex with an intern. But she was 23 years old. Uh, That's young. But I mean... She was the age of consent, and and they made such a big deal out of it. And I I know the real I realize that it, the big deal wasn't that he had sex with her. It was well he committed perjury. But that that goes back to well he broke the rule of law, so he lied about a fucking affair, man. Who would not lie about having an affair? Who wants that to fucking come out? Even if you're not. Uh, a serial uh, cheater like Bill Clinton, why would you want your wife, you know, to know? She might have already knew. They might have had an arrangement. I don't know. But, I mean, I I don't blame. uh, I'm not a Bill Clinton fan because he's a fucking criminal. He's a hypocrite. Um, I don't care about the government dealing drugs neither, except for the fact that the government's making money off drugs, but they're locking people up for, ten, you know, for the amount of drugs that the government brought in, people are in jail for life, okay? Um, some states, they might have even got the death penalty. So it's the hypocrisy, because I think all drugs should be legal, 
But I don't think the government should be involved in any business anyway. So there you go. But it's not the, oh, my God, uh, you're so bad because you did cocaine or were involved in selling cocaine. It's the fact that you're a fucking hypocrite because you're the governor. You got jails full of people that are doing what you're doing and not even close to what you're doing, you know, in terms of volume. And somehow this fucking guy becomes president. Now think about it. All the stuff he did and you think people didn't know about it. Oliver North testified in front of Congress that uh, during the hearings, I don't know if it was all of Congress, I think it was a committee, but during the Iran-Contra hearings that this, the, what was going on, not with Bill Clinton, but with the Iran-Contra uh, scandal or whatever you want to call it, that it was being printed in foreign newspapers. So the whole world basically knew about it except the people of the U.S., um, meaning like, and he used that as almost like a defense, like, well, everybody else knew about it. And point being that with all the stuff that they dig up on presidential candidates, you don't think they knew all this shit? And did we hear about it? Now, at the time uh, Clinton ran for office, I was kind of young um not that young but young enough um to you know right i think like junior high or something or high school and i wasn't paying attention to everything that was going on but i paid enough attention where i would have remembered hearing about mina arkansas and i never heard about it I didn't hear about it till um, recently, till I started looking at the Iran Contra uh, thing. I, but pr- besides that, I have I had never heard of Mita Arkansas ever. I didn't know Clinton had anything to do with Iran Contra. I knew you know Whitewater they brought up all the time, which was. Uh, I know with a real estate deal and supposedly, which I believe it, that they killed Vince Foster, who they they claimed it was a suicide, but there were none of his prints on the gun. The only prints they found on the gun were somebody else's, you know, all of this stuff comes out. Um, But, you know, they're bad people, the Clintons. And I'm not saying this because Hillary's running for president because it's as you know if you're a regular listener it's already been decided who's going to win for president and it doesn't fucking matter uh you know voting is pointless and all of that shit but they're they, they're a, a criminal family i mean they're like the kennedys and, and to be honest uh the kennedys aren't really that nothing compared to the clintons because the kennedys um, were involved in selling alcohol when it was illegal. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that because it never should have been made illegal. So I don't know if they did other things, like they were involved in murder and stuff like that and other type of corruption. You know, they, I know Ted drove into a fucking, uh, off a bridge and left a girl there to die while he was, because he was drunk you know, and, and shit like that. And I know it, political families, there's corruption and, and things like that. But um, I don't think that they were anywhere near the the Clintons. Um, but I haven't read a lot about, you know, the Kennedys. I know what I know just from news and, you know, general education, I guess. But... um the Clintons were involved in all this fucked up shit. And then you got this guy becoming the fucking president. And if you're going to be selling drugs, make fucking drugs legal. Then he's a, he same thing. I mean, although I did 
hear in the documentaries that I was listening to that he cut uh, a lot of the... I don't know if it was of the DEA or but a lot of the funding of the war on drugs. So I'll give him credit for that if assuming that's true because the, this was coming from people that are like oh, saying that that was bad. And oh look, he's a bad guy and he cut, you know, funding for the war on drugs and you know, of course Reagan put billions of or trillions probably throughout his presidency into it. So that was good, at least. But I mean, how can this guy, he was also a member of the Trilateral Commission. And I think that, you know, the whole thing with the Southern governors like Jimmy Carter, the same thing. It was a whole setup. He was picked uh, supposedly in college. He was a CIA operative and I believe Hillary was, too. And you know, it, it was arranged from the beginning. I believe that with Obama as well. It's it's all a fucking uh, rigged, it, but it's rigged to the point where, like, it's almost like a detailed script writer is writing this all out. I mean, you can't control everything that everybody does but you can greatly influence it. So, but the fact that somebody like that can become president is just uh, insane. It shows to me that even shows more how rigged it is because they, what comes out is what they want to come out. They control the narrative, uh, the powers that be who I explained before. I consider the powers that be the billionaires the corporations and the secret societies, if you want to call them that. They're not really secret, but Council on Foreign Relations, the, the elites that basically aren't part of government that have basically organizations that act like they're part of government. So anyway, uh, we'll get to Clinton today. We'll get to uh, Reagan more. I talked a little about him uh, at the beginning of his presidency, but we'll get to the Iran Contra uh, hearings and then the people that were involved. So, Barry Seal is the most uh, interesting of all of this, and really the reason why I wanted to do it. Now, I di I didn't want to do just a show on Barry Seal, although I probably could. So I didn't want to make sure I don't spend the whole rest of the show on Barry Seal, but there's enough information about him to really, you know, do a whole show on. So Barry Seal, and this information is from a book, um... And I got it from other documentaries as well. But there was a detailed book that went into the CIA uh, stuff. And it was called Barry and the Boys by Daniel Hopsicker. And the chapter, basically, I might as well read the chapter because on the uh, YouTube video I, I had watched on it, he read uh, read that chapter on Barry Seal. And a lot of this stuff were in other documentaries too, but this goes a little further. So from what I know about Barry Seal, the story, the government, um, shit, the shit that goes on and the stuff they have finally admitted to, although I still think they haven't admitted to everything, uh, I tend to believe pretty much what they had said in this book. So what they had said in this book was that Barry Seal was essentially recruited by the CIA almost in high school or right out of high school. And one of the reasons was his pilot skills, I guess. And th this I had heard from... Uh, a lot of people, even people that weren't 
uh, supporters, I guess, or part of, you know, people that were investigating things had said that Barry Seal was, you know, one of the best pilots they've ever seen. And the things that he could do with a plane, no matter whether it was a big plane or a small plane or whatever, that and and not as a fighter jet pilot. I mean, those might uh, fighter pilots may be better pilots as far as they may be able to uh, shoot them down and attack them and whatever. But just to get in and out of areas and how he could maneuver and things like that. So they had said that he was around, although they didn't know the details, but he was part of of a reserve special ops. He was, he was part of a reserve reserve special ops unit. And from what they were saying is either in that unit or outside of it, but it sounded like in that unit that David Ferry, who, if you have ever seen the movie JFK is played by Joe Pesci, as well as, uh, uh, Lee Harvey Oswald and um, the detective who was former FBI um, who again if you had seen JFK I can't think of his name right now but he was a uh, guy Bannister he was a private detective but he was still you know connected with the FBI CIA he's the guy who in the beginning of the movie, uh, you know, punch Jack Lemon, and then they had if if you had seen the movie, and then they questioned Jack Lemon. A guy Bannister was, I, I guess they had also said he was a big racist, and they ran some. Um, he, he was at the center of the intelligence community in New Orleans. It was all in one little area, and that he also ran um there were white supremacist fronts for white supremacist groups and shit like that and um it's fucked up but anyway uh he had known him as well and that he may have known Jack Ruby and may it's possible that he was involved in the JFK assassination or knew about it or um, had something to do with it after the fact trying to fly people you know out of Dallas now that's that part of it's not proven as far as whether he was involved in it or not but he was uh, from what they gathered he did know David Ferry. He did know Lee Harvey Oswald. And I know he knew who Guy Bannister was. I guess everybody did because he's from the New Orleans Baton Rouge. Well, Baton Rouge, but also uh, he was in the New Orleans area. He's from Louisiana. So that's where he kind of got his start. They also had said that he had a skill where he could read backwards and had a photographic memory. So if he was sitting at somebody's desk and, you know, someone's reading something that they don't want you to see, but they're like, well, you can't really read it backwards, that uh, he could do that. And the reason I bring that up is because that adds to, well, why would the CIA want a guy like Barry Seal? And I think between his plain uh, skills and that, and then, I guess, getting along with guys like David Ferry and, uh, well, everybody knows who Lee Harvey Oswald is. Those who haven't seen JFK or actually read any books on it, David Ferry was accused of uh, being involved in the plot to kill JFK. Now, he ended up dead they, of course, ruled it a suicide, but most likely he was killed. And Jim Garrison, who was the DA in, in New Orleans, who was the only person to this day to bring a case against 
the murderers of uh, JFK, they had said probably would have indicted him, although he might not have because he may had cooperated and testified, um, but he was killed. So, uh, but he had suspected him as being involved. And in the movie, I don't know how true this is. This is speculation by Oliver Stone. He met with um, Tommy Lee Jones's character, I, Clay. It was either Clay Shaw or Clay Bertrand. One was an alias. Clay Shaw, I think, who was the guy who was the only guy they charged uh, with the murder of uh, being involved in the plot. Uh, they charged him with conspiracy to kill JFK. And it was admitted later that he did work for the CIA and ran fronts for them and stuff like that. So whether he was involved in the plot to kill him, I don't know, but he probably was. Um, So anyway, that was kind of the beginnings of Barry Seal. So they, in a lot of stories, make it out to be that, like in the movie, he was a drug smuggler who started working for the DEA and the CIA as opposed to the other way around. Now, it doesn't, I don't know how he went from the CIA to becoming a drug smuggler. I would assume that it was under the CIA and he made these connections And if he's anything like the character Dennis Hopper played, which he seemed like he was when they interviewed him, like a friendly, he was kind of a, you know, making jokes all the time type of guy, that he made these connections and because he could fly planes the way he could, he was the guy who they had fly the equipment or uh, not equipment, but supplies to the Contras. So to kind of cut in there and back up, we had talked about this yesterday that in 1984, they had cut off funding the Contras, but even before that, and I don't know if Barry seal, I know he, they had said he set up in like 82 and originally in New Orleans or in uh, Baton Rouge. And then he moved out to Mena, Arkansas, I think in 82. And the Iran, Con- not the Iran Contra, but the Contras themselves. And when the, the U.S. got involved was kind of when it first happened, uh, 79, 80. Um, well, probably 81 when Reagan uh, got in office, but that's when the Sandinistas took over in 79, 80, something like that. So it was right around the same time that Barry Seal was smuggling drugs. But even before Congress passed a bill that said we're not going to fund uh, the Contras anymore in 1984, I believe he was flying in uh, supplies to the Contras at that point. So because they still needed, whether they were getting money from the U.S. government or somebody else, they needed to be able to fly into Nicaragua somehow and drop the supplies. And he would fly real low. And drop those supplies off. Now, the part that Oliver Stone, Oliver North never brought up, nor did anybody else in the hearings, as far as I know, they might have asked them about it, but I don't recall. And I can't watch all the hearings because they're they're hours and hours. But even back then, uh, them admitting anything about drugs. But so what would happen was... um, Pablo Escobar and the Medellin cartel had uh, a relationship with the Sandinistas and the Nicaraguan government. 
uh, I remember even in uh, the show Narcos, and I don't know how true this is, but they ended up at some point going to Nicaragua. Um, and then, and then of course, you had uh, Manuel Noriega as well in Panama, who uh, was a quote-unquote friend of the U.S., but was also involved in the drug business. So uh, they could stop there uh, if they needed to as well. And in one scene in the Dennis Hopper movie, they actually did that. Now, again, I don't know how true that is, but it sounds believable, especially being Manuel Noriega, who was a friend of George Bush. And along with that, (coughs) excuse me, I just drank water, went into my lungs. And something else I want to mention, my chair is like off, if you can hear it. Um, I try to keep it as quiet as possible, but that's not like me having gas or anything. That's my chair, just so everybody knows that. So uh, the other person that was involved in this when I was talking about how did Clinton become president George Bush Sr. was very involved in this as well. In fact, Barry Seal had his private fucking number, okay? And that's a fact that was validated by the Louisiana State Police that when they searched his uh, car after he was killed, a bunch of stuff was taken, and we'll get into why. But they had found uh, George Bush's personal number, uh somewhere in the car or on him or something like that. So he was in contact with George Bush. And you think about that at the time, Bush was the vice president, but he also used to run the CIA. So, you know, he knows about all this shit and what goes on and what they do and, and all of that. So he really, from what I understand was the one running everything. And Reagan was aware of what was going on. He probably wanted some deniability. So it was, okay, you handle this. You get it done. Uh, I want to be able to deny. And they set it up that way on purpose. But he, I would think, and from what was in um, documents and stuff like that, that he knew about it, but he knew just enough to be able to deny being involved, I guess. So, he, but he knew what was going on, and that's what he wanted to happen, and that's what happened. I, As far as being involved in the day-to-day, I don't know how much, if he got briefs on it or anything like that. Probably not just for the whole idea that he could deny it, the plausible deniability shit. And presidents do this all the time where they want things to happen and they may give an order for something to happen and do it in a way that they're not involved in it and they can deny knowing all this stuff. So they're not committing perjury and they're not technically doing anything illegal, although I would say it's still illegal, but... So, uh, Barry, getting back to Barry Seal, so he sets up in Mena, Arkansas in 1982 after he got, they say he got kicked out of Louisiana. I don't know how exactly he got kicked out, but anyway, it was probably the CIA that said, okay, we got a corrupt governor and fucking Clinton, you know, this guy who is banging all these women, his brother's a coke, coke head, you know, he does coke. He's, he's corrupt. Um, we're going to move to this little tiny town of 5,000 people in Arkansas that has an airstrip and we're all set. So they pretty much took over the Mena airport with, you know, uh, Barry Seals guys, um, which would be various uh, pilots 
as well as the people that would work on the planes. And he had this thing called a C-123. It was, uh, they called it the fat lady. And I think even Pablo Escobar called them like uh, El Gordito or something like that. And which means, well, that means the fat. But <laughs> um, he might have called them the fat man or something. But Gordito, Gordito uh, is fat. Or Gordo's fat, but, you know. Um, so he moves there. He's flying the weapons over to Nicaragua, then coming back with at least 150 to 200 kilos of cocaine. And who he's moving that stuff to, I have no idea. Uh, Most of the pilots, from what I understand, we're just bringing it into the country and handing it off who to whoever they told to hand it off for. They didn't get a percentage of the profits or have anything to do with actually selling the drugs. They were just the transporters and they'd make like $500,000 a flight. And you're talking about the eighties. I mean, that's a lot of money now. So he'd make that money and then, I don't know the details it it didn't go into, which is kind of irrelevant, you know, who would uh, come to pick the stuff up. But, you know, you're talking about 200 kilos. That's a lot of cocaine. And I don't know how often he would uh, fly these missions, but and whether and I'm sure he would go there both uh, to drop off weapons as well as to pick up cocaine. So when he dropped off the weapons, he picked up cocaine, but I don't think it was just, well, he only picked up cocaine when he dropped off the weapons. And he had actually started with weed, and then he ended up getting hooked up with the Medellin cartel. Uh, According to the movie with Dennis Hopper, somebody else hooked him up, and I kind of looked that up. And in Wikipedia, it says... They, there was a friend who hooked them up with the Medellin cartel. Wikipedia is written by people, plus it didn't go into anything about the truth about Barry Seal, and I don't know how reliable that is. But uh, however he got involved, at the time, they were the biggest in the world when it came to cocaine. It was the Medellin cartel. Later... After Escobar was killed and even when he uh, went on the run, um, you know, they kind of things kind of slowly fell apart. The Ochoa brothers, I believe, kept on after uh, Pablo Escobar was killed because I was talking about yesterday, the Medellin cartel. The Ochoa brothers and Escobar were the main uh, people in the Medellin cartel. And then there was uh, Gaucho, but he was killed in, I'm not sure about the year, Carlos Later, which ended up going to jail. And by the 90s, by 1990, it was really just Escobar and the Ochoa brothers. And that was it. And then even they started uh, to have... uh, I think a fallout at some point. Um, But I'm not sure if at the time uh, Pablo Escobar died, if he was still um, in contact with them or, or or not. Um, But after that, then the Cali uh, cartel kind of took over, which is another part of Colombia. And they were kind of, you know, had a truce with each other, but ended up going to war um, with each other to an extent. And they had hooked up with the Castro brothers, not no relation to the Cubans, that started this uh, group, the people against Pablo Escobar or something like that, and were killing uh, a whole bunch of people as well. Anybody that was involved with Pablo Escobar. 
And a lot of this is in the uh, the show Narcos. Uh, season two actually just came out a couple weeks ago. And I guess this is a spoiler, sort of. But being that it's it's well known that Pablo Escobar was killed in 1993, the first two seasons uh, cover the life of Pablo Escobar. And at, and at the end, it's of... Uh, narcos is goes up to the end of pablo escobar's life the first two seasons and it, and they left it open i think what's going to happen is in season three it's going to be the median cart up uh, the median the uh cali cartel that they go after and i think it's going to turn more into fiction than uh being more based on uh the actual events even though a lot of it didn't happen with the agents a lot of the stuff with the actual agents didn't happen because I had seen a uh, speech by the real agents that are portrayed in Narcos because anybody who's seen Narcos, it's a Netflix original. It covers two DEA agents from the U S and their search for Pablo Escobar and to bring down Pablo Escobar. And it also, you know, goes through the life of Pablo Escobar. I think it went through it way too fast because it went through his life in two seasons. I mean, they could have done it in a lot longer. You know, the first season, you're already at, I think, 1991 or something. And Escobar died in 93. So, and that's the only reason I bring up, you know, the end of it is where he dies, where he, you know, because he actually died in 93. But, I mean, that's what I expected anyway. I mean, knowing uh, what I know about Pablo Escobar's life, it was obvious that they couldn't, they brought it far enough where, the end of that season, there was no place else to go <laughs> if you're going to stay true to his life. So that's where I think it's going to be more fictional when it comes to these agents, because I don't think these agents investigated the Car Cali cartel or stayed in Colombia after they got Escobar. And maybe they'll cover the true story of the Cali cartel and they'll, uh, change the people that are in it or whatever I, I don't know what they're end up doing in the future uh but the first two seasons were you know pablo escobar but again i think there's a long period of time where he was in control and i think that was from at least 1980 where he you know was the main guy in the median cartel until 1993 at least if not earlier so you have you know all these years and there's 10 episodes in this fucking series and they turn you know minimum 13 years into you know 20 episodes they could have easily done it in four and got more into some of the stuff that they didn't cover now don't get me wrong it, it's a really good series but I just think they could have done it better and covered more of Pablo Escobar. So, and they make him out, of course, to be a terrible guy. They don't really show any, I mean, they, they show how much he cares about his family. That's about it. And was he as bad as they made him out to be? Usually nobody ever is as bad as they make him out to be um, because they, want they the powers that be of course want you to think that drug dealers are evil and they're terrible and whatever and i look at pablo escobar as somebody who actually went to war with the government now the funny thing is is the contras were far worse did far worse things than pablo escobar did um he did a couple of similar things but not a lot. But the Contras started doing some fucked up shit. And they were being funded by 
not only funded by the CIA, but run by the CIA, CIA. And then you think about how much of that were they told to do as they did things like I said yesterday, you know, attacked innocent people and blew up villages and killed a whole bunch of people. I mean, they did a lot of shit. So uh, back to Barry Seal. So he sets up in Mena, Arkansas. Bill Clinton, I played the clip yesterday, of course, said he didn't know anything about this. This was a federal thing. That's a bunch of bullshit. He totally knew about it. He made money off it. Um, he admitted to his bodyguard. We'll get to that because um, he had sent him on runs with Barry Seal. So Barry Seal works uh, for the Mid and cartel primarily. Uh, as far as I know, he didn't deal with anybody else when it came to cocaine. And he would, uh, you know, work. He was working for the U.S. government, dropping off the supplies, and then drop uh, coming back with uh, 150, 200 kilos when he'd make a run of cocaine. Now, one of the things that he did that they had mentioned was he would record every call with his handlers or the CIA or the DEA or whoever he was dealing with. Um, and he'd keep that with him, um, you know, like a briefcase full of information. I mean, this was a guy who was in direct contact with Bush, the vice president of the United States. So things were fine for a while. In 84, though, he did get, and this is where... What I don't understand, and I don't know if they did this on purpose or what, but he got caught in Florida. So he had a case pending in Florida uh, for uh, drug smuggling. So while that was going on, he just, you know, of course, continued to do what he was doing. Nothing really changed, but he had that case going on. Now, while that case was going on, that's where he supposedly made... See, this is what they say. Now, why he would have to make a deal with the DEA and the CIA wouldn't just take care of it, I don't know. Now, it was a state charge, I believe, and they were dealing with Florida. And I don't know if because of the sensitivity of him bringing back cocaine, you think about that. Do they want to admit that this guy's working for the CIA and he's bringing back, you know, tons of cocaine, literally? So they sort of stepped in in the sense of, you know, the DEA obviously, um, it was probably more of a setup thing as opposed to him going to the DEA on his own because that's how they try to make it out to be in some reports um, and saying, oh, you know, I'll, I'll make a deal with you. Now, on the other side of that, you're dealing with a bunch of people in fucking Colombia. And the United States got very involved in that. Of course, they had to have the permission of Colombia. But at the same time, you know, the U.S. can put pressure on you. They're a superpower and all of this stuff. And none of these people are technically committing any crimes in the U.S. Because they're not the ones actually bringing it. They're producing it and giving it to other people who are bringing it you know, to the U S now the money coming back is obviously coming back to them, but they're not directly selling cocaine themselves in the U S. So I don't know if that would be a conspiracy charge, a, you know, the way that they, uh, I forget what the, the name of the charge is, but the way they catch, uh, mafia, the heads of the mafia, uh, with uh, what racketeering or um, 
Is that what they call it? There's a specific charge where, you know, they used it to tie in the mafia bosses because they weren't doing any of the stuff. They were just ordering it through other people. But it was in the same country and they were ordering it as opposed to, you know, this is totally different. And the United States got very involved in the hunt for Pablo Escobar. And of course, all that did was just give power to another cartel. You know, when you take out a drug dealer, all that does is op- is a job opening for somebody else ready to take it. And that's why another reason why, of course, the drug war is bullshit and a failure. And there's many other reasons why at the same time, because people that want to get high will do whatever they got to do to get high. And that's why you have all these drugs, uh, synthetic shit that wouldn't even exist if it wasn't for uh, the drug war. But he got busted in 84 in Florida and made a deal with the DEA. And this deal was, it was very strange, the whole thing. And that's kind of, I guess, how you know that they tried to, like, he wasn't going to jail. And in Florida, he ended up getting time served, and that was it, I believe, or nothing. I mean, it was, um, it was essentially... You know, you do this and it didn't seem like what I'm getting to is it didn't seem like a deal that you would normally expect somebody to get. Um, you know, it, it was like they were trying to do their best to get them out of it without arising any suspicion as to what he was doing. So he agreed to, I guess, testify against, which I don't know what this does, but against the Medellin cartels and, or the members of the Medellin cartel. But that doesn't mean anything if they are not able to extradite them to the United States. Now, I don't remember the years, but Carlos Lader, who was also, as I mentioned yesterday, the character in Blow was based on him, Johnny Depp, uh, Boston George's friend. And in, in reality, that was the guy that Boston George, George Jung, uh, Op, uh, went into business with Carlos later who f- screwed him over and whatever. Um, so he was the actual guy in the movie. They called him Diego Delgado. And then I don't know that what in that movie is true outside of that, but I do know cause um, even uh, Boston George got out of jail and had talked about, it's funny, I got arrested in the town that he was from, Weymouth, Massachusetts. Um, they had um, worked together outside of that. Um, oh, no, he had said that in an interview that a lot of the movie, you know, wasn't true. And this was true, but this wasn't, you know, that happens with movies. So you can't, I said this yesterday too, you can't take a movie unless it's a a documentary. And even then, you know, you got to verify some stuff, but, but the guy who he did work with Carlos later, and that was the whole, um, his, his, uh, partner who introduced him to the Medellin cartel and got him involved with that and that whole thing. So that was true, and he was in jail with him. So he ended up being extradited. So in Colombia, and this is why Pablo Escobar for a little while was actually part of their government there. I forget how it's set up, the Senate or 
um, I don't know what they called it over in Colombia, but he was a alternate. But the guy, I I don't know how that works. The, the Colombian government at the time, but he ended up replacing the guy. Um, he didn't kill him or anything. He either stepped down or whatever. So he was part of uh, their government, basically the equivalent of Congress here. And his main thing was to get rid of, they had signed, the president at the time had signed extradition uh, treaties with the United States. Before that, they did not have them. And they ended up getting rid of them. So during the time they did have them, uh, Carlos Later, who was a fucked up guy, was a part German and part Colombian and was a Nazi, essentially, uh, was idolized Hitler, uh, which is pretty fucked up. And they don't obviously cover any of that in the movie Blow and not that they should. I mean, it doesn't really, it's not really relevant to what's going on in the movie, but he uh, had a Nazi tattoo, at least in the, um, in the show. But I think he had one in real life and I've seen him uh, a speech that he gave. He started getting political over um, and going on radio because they were speaking out against this uh, extradition. But at the time that uh, Barry Seal was supposed to testify about, you know, again, I don't know what this would do. I guess he had told the Medellin cartel about it and said that he was going to testify against the United States because of all the information that he had. So, Supposedly, he wasn't worried about the Medellin cartel coming after him. Now, in his murder, and we'll get into details a little later, but um, it's all always reported that the Medellin cartel killed him because they hired Colombians. But it's pretty well, um, I think proven through others testimony not testimony but through others um including the Louisiana State Police uh that most likely Oliver North and through other uh information that Oliver North ordered the hit on Barry Seal and that came most likely from George Bush um, a couple weeks before that, George Bush had um, he had threatened to uh, th- threaten George Bush and to release information about them. So we will uh, get to that. So in 1984 also was when Congress passed the bill that they can no longer fund the Contras. So that's done as far as the funding. So they said, of course, and Reagan wasn't involved in this according to some documents. But again, as I was saying, I don't think he was that closely involved and it was okay. You know, I, I, from what I understand, it was Bush who was running everything, but still under the orders of Reagan to, you know, and he might have even said it in a way that he couldn't be held accountable. But Reagan had, as I was talking about yesterday, of course, his everything's a war with the government, right? So his war basically on communism, that if Nicaragua is communism, if if they continue to be a communist country that could spread to the rest of South America alliances with the Soviet union, blah, blah, blah. Cause of course all communist countries are going to like each other and uh, support each other, which is the, the concept of just cause you have the same government. It's ridiculous. So 
and they should have t- totally stayed out of it. But of course, the United States never stays out of it. anything. And I'm sure that they've influenced 90 something percent via covert operations of uh, elections and of the operations of countries throughout the world. You know, uh, a couple offhand is, uh, of course, Iran, Chile, most of the countries in the Middle East. Um, Africa, I believe they got involved in, although the English and French, I think especially the French were heavily involved in in Africa and certain countries. But definitely Central and South America. Um, Of course, uh, Panama with Manuel Noriega, who they later sent the army in to arrest. It's crazy. It's like one minute. Yeah, you're our friend until we don't need you anymore. And then uh, we're going to fuck you over. And I'm being America, what the, what the American government says, because it's not a, we, and I had mentioned the last couple of days that somebody said something about, you know, the people are the government, which is, so far from reality um i don't know so in 84 those two things had happened so that's when you know oliver north who i believe was i mean they were already running all of this anyway so i don't think it changed anything except the funding so they're all involved in this and it's like, okay, we need to continue, but we don't have the funding. Congress isn't funding us anymore. So how are we going to get the funding? And that's where they had already dealt with Iran and the hostage thing. This is only three years later. They had also told Iran they would give them weapons. So I don't know if they had been giving them weapons or not, but I mentioned this Bonifar guy who was there when they made the deal to hold the hostages until Reagan was elected. I was going to say erected. And Oliver North dealt with him and some other people and said, okay, We'll sell you, you know, all these weapons because we need money to fund the war in Nicaragua. So I'm going to take a quick break when we come back. Uh, We'll continue with Barry Seal, uh, how Bill Clinton gets involved and basically was involved, I think, since 82 uh, when it, it it started at uh, Mina Airport and and the uh, other things that had went on investigations, people getting killed, cover ups, and and all of that stuff. So we'll take a quick break and play some important clips, and then when we get back. We will talk all about or we'll continue all about Barry Seal and Iran Contra and all of these corrupt politicians that three of them were actually presidents. Reagan, Bush became president. Same thing. How did this fucking guy become president after all the fucked up shit he did the same way Clinton, uh, you know, became president. But, uh, We'll talk about that and more when we come back. So be sure to check us out at Nonpartisan Liberty for All. And, of course, if you'd like to call in and comment or you have any additional information that you'd like to discuss, you can call us at 702-470-7664. That's 702-470-7664. Or send us a contact request on Skype to Nonpartisan Liberty for All. It's all one word. 
with your name and what you want to talk about. And if you call us, it'd be better. Just send a text of what you want to talk about, and I can just call you back. Is probably the best way to get you on the air. Otherwise, I'll have to screen the call and wait for a break and all that shit. So, so definitely check us out at Nonpartisan Liberty for All. There's also donate pages. Uh, there's a donate page and there's the donate button uh, everywhere, <laughs> essentially. Uh, so if you'd like to donate, um, we could definitely use the money as the show is 100% self-funded by me and my full-time job. But if you can't, totally understandable. I don't expect people to donate. But if you'd like to, that would be great, too. So we will be right back with uh, more on the Iran-Contra scandal or whatever you want to call it. <laughs> Nonpartisan Liberty for all dot com. Uh, of living an exciting life is high. Uh, you can't sit in Baton Rouge and uh, go to work from nine to five on Monday through Friday and go to the LSU football games on Saturday night and church on Sunday morning and have an exciting life. That may be exciting to ninety nine percent of the population, but to me it's not. And the exciting thing in life to me is to get into a life-threatening situation. Now, that's excitement. This is Barry Seal, a highly publicized drug smuggler originally operating out of Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Since 1978, he carried out one of the largest drug smuggling operations between the United States and Central America. In the spring of 1982, Louisiana State Police warned Seal that they would tail him wherever he went in efforts to stop his operation. It's believed that SEAL decided to move his operation out of that state after the warning. It was here at Rich Mountain Aviation that authorities believed Barry SEAL moved his operation. Terry Capehart owned a business at the Mina Airport, and he remembers when he first met Barry SEAL in 1981. Of course, I didn't know who Barry SEAL was. I'd never heard of the man. And uh, Freddie introduced me to him. Capehart didn't know of SEAL's drug background then, but remembers that this man, Joe Evans, former partner of Freddie Hampton, brought in one of Steele's planes to Rich Mountain Aviation. Evans declined to comment for TV5 News, saying it's his policy to, quote, keep quiet, unquote. Capehart said he began to see more and more of Barry Seal, especially after the spring of 1982. He didn't suspect anything until the Polk County Sheriff called him in with some troubling information. I've came uh, in possession of some information that indicated some aircraft being serviced and stored on the uh, airport here was being used in an illegal international operation. Capehart then began noticing some alterations to Barry Seal's aircraft that he says are common to drug smugglers. That I seen myself, uh, Freddie and Dwayne Hill, which was an employee of Rich Mountain Aviation, changed the end number on one of the airplanes so that they were both identical and then the aircraft made a flight. If they got caught or somebody was on them or turned the end number in, they can just take the tape, yank it off the airplane, the airplane's set say in, in Florida or Louisiana, wherever, DEA or, or an agency comes up and asks about it, they'll say, hey, this is not the end number. That airplane's sitting in Mean, Arkansas inside the hangar. A former employee of Rich Mountain Aviation also saw unusual modifications and was given far-fetched reasons for them. What Joe had told me that it was going to be used to transport porpoises on. And he, the other guy just kind of looked at Joe and said, that's a good one. Well, Former Sheriff Hadaway says he had plenty of evidence to prove a conspiracy, but in 1984, Minister Seal became an informant for the Federal Drug Enforcement Agency. It was then that the sheriff was told to halt his investigation into Seal and Rich Mountain Aviation. Two years later, Seal was murdered by Colombian hitmen for his role as an informant. The grand jury is expected to look into the activities of Barry Seal at Mina Airport prior to 1984. Local investigators believe they have a strong case, but have wondered why it's taken so long to come to court. Tomorrow night, we'll show how the covert smuggling of arms to Contra rebels in Nicaragua may have slowed down one aspect of drug investigations by local authorities.
This man, the late Barry Seal, was a known drug smuggler, whom authorities believed moved his drug smuggling base of operation from Baton Rouge, Louisiana, to Mena, Arkansas, in 1982. In 1984, he parked this plane at Rich Mountain Aviation at Mena's airport. I know that one time um, Mr. Seals was working in it and he had some ropes around it. And we were instructed not to go near the plane while Mr. Seals was in there working. Was informed that this aircraft had been used to smuggle some cocaine into the United States. Then subsequent to that, some information that it may have been used to uh, in an operation that was used to embarrass the Nicaraguan government. With this information, the former sheriff sought a court order to confiscate the plane in June of 1984. Everything was lined up, but then he received a telephone call from a drug enforcement agency supervisor from Miami named Robert Jara. He finally disclosed to me and asked me not to uh, confiscate the airplane, told me that if I did, that I would just be ordered to give it back to him that, in fact, the DEA did have a large financial interest in the aircraft. At this point, Hadaway's investigation into Barry Seal's drug smuggling activities at Rich Mountain Aviation came to a screeching halt. Six months later, Seal's plane left Mina. The next time the sheriff heard about it, it had crashed in Nicaragua during a gun-running mission to the Contra rebels. Hadaway's run-in with the DEA would have gone unnoticed, except for an April 1987 broadcast on CBS's West 57th Street called The CIA Connection, Drugs for Guns. Do you really believe the government decided to get into the drug business in order to pay for the contract? The American government. Uh, as incredulous as it may sound, I, I believe that not only decided to get into it, I think they orchestrated the whole thing. I need more on that. Bring it up a bit. Go ahead. There you go. These two Fort Smith men saw the story and were discussing it in a local bar. An assistant U.S. attorney overheard their conversation and told him his office was working on a case just like that. He mentioned that their office had a case and that in the process of that, they had contacted some people in Florida for some assistance and that another agency in Florida had contacted their office and told them to drop the case to get off of it. It bothers me to think that a competent attorney's office could be restrained from doing its job. It's, uh, that's what bothers me. These men also say the attorney said the case in question involved very seal activities in the MENA area. The Congressional Subcommittee on Crime has now begun its own investigation into the MENA connection. Tomorrow night, we'll show you how a probe into a money laundering scheme in MENA seems to have gone nowhere. The issue of a drug smuggling conspiracy revolves around this convicted drug smuggler, the late Barry Seal. Former Seal pilots spoke at a grand jury this week about whether their former boss had moved his operation from Baton Rouge, Louisiana to Rich Mountain Aviation in Mena, Arkansas. One pilot who testified told TV5 News Rich Mountain Aviation was simply used by Barry Seal and Seal didn't involve the company in his drug smuggling activities. But a couple years ago, other witnesses testified at a grand jury about another possible aspect of this conspiracy, money laundering. And nothing happened. Catherine Gann used to work as a secretary for Freddie Hampton of Rich Mountain Aviation. She says she handled lots of cash for her boss, but sometimes in an extraordinary manner. I was told to deposit the large amounts of cash in uh, amounts of less than $10,000. Even if we had fifteen or twenty thousand dollars, I would go to two separate banks and deposit um, less than ten thousand at one bank and less than ten thousand at another. What she's talking about is money laundering or structuring deposits to avoid filling out one of these Internal Revenue Service forms called a currency transaction report. I asked Fred Hampton why he wanted me to deposit it this way and he said IRS won't get this we won't have to pay taxes on it. Union Bank of Mina is one of the banks that Kathy Gann was told to deposit large amounts of cash. One Union Bank employee told TV5 News that on one occasion a former bank official divided the cash for Rich Mountain Aviation and personally went to different tellers and had each of them deposit $10,000 into the Rich Mountain Aviation account. 
Catherine Gann gave testimony to an IRS agent about the illegal practice, but found that when she appeared before a grand jury, it asked no questions about the money laundering. When I left there, I was wondering, as I walked down the hall, I wondered, well, why did they bring me up here? In the meantime, the fact that she gave testimony has caused her to live in fear. I, I kept waiting and waiting to hear from somebody, and I was scared all this time. I didn't know what was going to happen to me. I, you know, I knew that, that his truck had been outside my house. I was scared for my girls. People close to this issue wonder why such a cut-and-dried case failed to produce indictments. The former Polk County uh, Sheriff has lost faith in the process of justice. They really have, uh, do not have a great deal of confidence in, in the function of the federal criminal justice system at this time. But even if this grand jury fails to produce any indictments, other law enforcement officials say they will continue their separate investigations. In Nina, I'm Teresa Dickey reporting for the news people. Nina is a town of patriots and pickups, a town of 5,000 in the mountains of western Arkansas, a place that would seem as far away from American foreign policy as a place could get. And yet, one little airport on the southern edge of town is managing to raise questions that extend far beyond the city limits. A thousand miles away from Nina, here in Washington, there are investigators for both the House and the Senate who would like to know what's going on at that little airport in western Arkansas. As Oliver North's public battle over government secrets and the illegal supply of weapons to the Nicaraguan Contras is waged in Washington, congressional investigators in recent months have tried to learn if Mina, Arkansas was an illegal staging area for shipping guns to the U.S.-backed Contra rebels. This is a strange story. The facts already known are bizarre enough. What Unit 5 has been able to learn makes this story stranger still. It all begins in 1982, when this man, Adler Berryman Seal, showed up in Mena, Arkansas. My top load paid me one and a half million dollars for a single trip. Barry Seal was a drug smuggler, an extraordinary multi-million dollar a year drug smuggler, who with the help of several associates kept and serviced his drug planes in a hangar at the Mena airport. Those planes, according to investigators, were illegally modified with extra fuel tanks and instruments in order to fly long-distance drug missions to Central and South America. Barry Seal paid his associates for those modifications with tens of thousands of dollars in cash, money which, according to investigators, was illegally laundered by Seal's associates at banks in Mina. Yeah, I'm pleading guilty. But when Barry Seal was finally caught in 1984, investigators for the FBI, the IRS, and other agencies of law enforcement were told little or nothing about a special deal he had made with the Federal Drug Task Force headed by then Vice President George Bush. The deal? The government kept Barry Seal out of jail, and in exchange, Seal became a drug informant and helped put in jail some of his own associates in the international drug trade. But that wasn't all that Barry Seal did. Russell Welch, criminal investigator for the Arkansas State Police. Did Barry Seal ever say to you, I work for the CIA? He said he was working, had worked for the CIA. Unit 5 has learned in the early 1980s, even before his arrest, Seal had bought one of his planes from a CIA front, Air America. The plane was used by Seal for drug smuggling, and the CIA company was paid in the traditional drug dealer fashion of $300,000 in cash. According to this confidential FBI teletype obtained by Unit 5, one of SEAL's associates said he was maintaining SEAL's aircraft at the MENA airport for the CIA. So what was Barry SEAL actually doing? One federal agent under a very strict confidence told me that it was assumed within his agency Barry SEAL was carrying guns to Central America in exchange, was bringing drugs back on a free ride. Russell Welch of the Arkansas State Police was one of dozens of investigators who for years had been tracking Barry Seal and his associates. As these documents obtained by Unit 5 indicate, the FBI, the IRS, Customs, and the Attorney General of Louisiana formed just a partial list of those who wanted some answers. They didn't get them. Internal FBI documents indicate investigators were told not to look into any of Seal's activities that occurred before his 1984 plea agreement. So, blocked from seeking indictments against SEAL, investigators sought indictments against SEAL's associates at the MENA airport for allegedly aiding in the drug smuggling and for alleged IRS violations. So far, no indictments have been produced. 
At the end of this year, the statute of limitations will run out on those alleged crimes. As for Barry Seal, time ran out in 1986 when he was assassinated in Louisiana by Colombian drug dealers. Some of Seal's secrets died with him, but some of those secrets today remain guarded by the National Security Council, the agency for which Oliver North worked. The NSC has blocked a recent congressional request to examine the relationship of drug smuggling to American foreign policy in Central America. As a citizen, America didn't get to stay in court. Good morning, guys. You know, the, the question here that I want to bring up right now is, did, is the story true about Bill Clinton when he was governor of Arkansas and Bush Sr. when he was head of the CIA? Were they dealing drugs out of Mena, Arkansas? Well, the fact is, yes, it is true. Um, I was working in the shoe store. I was running our shoe store, I should say, back then. And uh, I ran for 12 years. And um, I had two different couples come in who had been through that area in their motorhome. And they said people, most people did not want to talk about what was going on. They were scared to death. They were afraid of being killed. One lady said her and her whole family, they were trying to get the hell out of there because they were after them. As I recall, there was somewhere between 150 to over 200 people that were killed uh, protecting the Clintons. Two young kids who came, who got too close to the airport out there where they were running the drugs in and out. Um, they were found killed on the railroad tracks, but then as the people later found out, they had stab wounds in them. Although the documented information contained in the Clinton Chronicles continues to be reported in England and other countries, here in America, the media blackout continues. Did Clinton, do you have any direct knowledge that Clinton had, uh, was aware of the drug operation coming into Arkansas? Uh, the direct knowledge is that uh, Buddy Young was actually an uh, advisor to Clinton. He was his chief of security, and he was one on board the aircraft, and he was sent there uh, by Clinton to investigate the loss of monies that had been determined. Uh, additional direct knowledge comes in the fact that uh, one of the people called by Barr uh, was the governor of Arkansas on that SATCOM. He called North, he called the vice president from during on this 24th of March uh, conversation, and he called the governor of Arkansas and talked to him. So, uh, and governor of Arkansas then was William Jefferson Clinton. So they were talking about the enterprise, about the lost monies. Uh, and additionally, in, in earlier years, and when I was at Fort Campbell, Kentucky, I actually flew uh, several missions carrying medical coolers again uh, with money and drugs in it into uh, Arkansas. Out of where, Fort Campbell? Out of Fort Campbell. It was delivered to us by the 324th Med Battalion. Who, out of the South America? Out of South America. Uh, they, they were operating in the South America in, in Honduras. It was flown by C-130 to Fort Campbell. It was marked medical supplies. Donor organs, this particular one, was marked. Um, and we were advised to give it to Dr. Lassiter uh, at uh, Little Rock Air Force Base. So we flew it to Little Rock Air Force Base. I opened the coolers. I don't, op I don't fly a cooler without opening it. I don't fly anything without opening it. Let me tell you why I don't fly coolers without opening them. I was told by Colby earlier that uh, Torrijos died simply because they put a uh, donor organ, uh, cooler marked donor, donor organs on his aircraft that blew up in flight. So whenever I see a cooler, I open that cooler. And what did you find in the cooler? We found a, a large sum of money, three co kilos of cocaine in one cooler, and the other cooler we found uh, all cocaine. Uh, those two coolers were picked up by Dr. Lassiter, who actually ended up being, as we found out in later years, a man named Dan Lassiter, who was convicted for trafficking cocaine in Arkansas. However, he was uh, pardoned by the then governor of Arkansas, Bill Clinton. And uh, did uh, you have any information that Clinton had direct knowledge of that? No, you flew him into Arkansas. Was, was Clinton there waiting for it, or was there a limousine there or anything like that? We had to wait over an hour and a half uh, for Dr. Lasseter to show up. But when he finally showed up, he showed up in an entourage of vehicles. There was a van, there was a stretch limo, and uh, an unmarked police car. 
Uh, in, in the coming out of the uh, stretch limo, uh, Dr. Lassiter came forward. Uh, he had two people with him. One stayed at the car and one came over. He introduced uh, the one uh, that walked over to, with, to uh, the aircraft to pick up the coolers as uh, the governor of Arkansas. And the governor of Arkansas extended his hand, and that's the first time I shook the hand of uh, William Jefferson Clinton. He, let, he wanted to let me know that the people of Arkansas appreciated me bringing those uh, donor organs. It, 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 oh, that gets, he, he didn't know you'd looked into him. He huh? didn't know I looked into it. Do you have that in your book? Yes, I do. Yeah, that's in, uh, again, the Dayton Chronicles, right? He used to smuggle drugs, then he got caught, and he became one of the government's most valuable informants in the war against cocaine. But last night in Louisiana, Barry Seal's enemies caught up with him and killed him. Tonight, three men are in custody. NBC's Brian Ross reports that Seal was about to testify for the government once again. Authorities believe last night's machine gun killing of top drug informant Barry Seal was ordered by drug bosses in Medellin, Colombia, who sent five men to Baton Rouge to kill Seal. Seal's son, Barry Jr., one of five children, was restrained by police, who said the gunman had waited in ambush for Seal at a Salvation Army shelter, where Seal had been sentenced by a federal judge on a drug charge to do community service. Seal was a tough guy TWA pilot who got caught smuggling cocaine and became one of the most important and daring undercover operatives, infiltrating the top Colombian drug operations. In a recent interview, Seal said he knew he was risking his life. The old saying, if you can't stand the heat, don't work in the kitchen. I can take the pressure. It was Seal who posed as a smuggler and flew into Nicaragua and took these pictures, showing Colombian drug dealers and Sandinista officials loading cocaine on his plane. Seal busted up the Colombian connection in the Caribbean country of Turks and Caicos, setting up a payoff meeting on videotape that led to the arrest and conviction of the country's prime minister. And Seal was scheduled to be the key witness against this man, Jorge Ochoa, the top Colombian drug boss, now in jail in Spain, about to be extradited to the United States. Authorities say the Ochoa Drug Organization was responsible for the bombing of the U.S. Embassy in Bogota last year, the assassination of Colombia's Attorney General, and now the murder in Louisiana of the man who was perhaps the most important undercover drug informant ever. Brian Ross, NBC News. So here, then, is the MENA scandal's big, dirty secret. Barry Seal was no accident. He didn't just stumble onto MENA. Nor did he just happen to luck into his eventual career. Instead, he was a lifelong member of what E. Howard Hunt puckishly refers to as clandestine services. I mean, I sat out here at this airport at the state hangar while the uh, DEA people sat over there watching him modify a Beach 18 right out here on the ramp. And I just asked him, I said, well, why don't you just go get him? And they, one of the guys told me one time there, he said, He's either the slickest operator there ever was, or he's working for us. There's former Attorney General Ed Meese, for example. Top IRS investigator Bill Duncan was prevented from testifying to Congress about what he knew about a $400,000 bribe, which Barry paid Ed Meese. And then, of course, there's Oliver North. At this Baton Rouge restaurant, witnesses told us, North was seen with Barry Seal. And one top law enforcement official told us that an investigating committee of the U.S. Congress in 1988 heard enough evidence of North's drug smuggling to send him to jail for the rest of his life. In America, being connected, of course, means never having to say you're sorry. And we like what former CIA pilot and lawyer Gary Idle said to us about North. Going to church doesn't make you a Christian any more than going to a car wash makes you a car. And then there's the King Air 200, like this one tying Barry Seal to George W. Bush. While Barry Seal's ties to former President Bush have been well known for years, the most talked about event in Seal's life concerns the persistent rumor that Barry had videotaped a hastily aborted DEA cocaine sting in which were caught George Bush's two sons, George W. and Jeb, caught picking up kilos of cocaine at a Florida airport we have not been able to prove this persistent allegation. But the search for proof turned up something just as shocking. The King Air used in the alleged sting went from being flown in drug smuggling missions by Barry Seal 
to later becoming the favorite airplane of Texas Governor George W. Bush. As Bogey might have put it, of all the planes in all the world, he had to fly in mine. And the owners of the King Air in between Barry and George W. Bush all had ties to the Bush family and were involved in some of the most notorious and unpunished financial frauds of the 1980s. And this one King Air reveals like nothing else we've seen the bipartisan nature of this scandal. We discovered a note in Barry Seal's own handwriting revealing that the man who originally gave this plane to Seal was a close associate of Charles Manat, the national chairman during the early 80s of the Democratic Party. We remembered a curious incident from the 1984 Democratic Convention when Walter Mondale, the party's presidential nominee, was prevented from choosing his own man as party chairman, the presidential candidate's traditional prerogative. They wouldn't let him replace Charles Manat. When the Democratic Convention was called to order this afternoon, the gavel was in the hands of Democratic National Committee Chairman Charles Manat. As party chairman, the job of calling the convention to order was rightfully his. As Sandra Van Oka reports, over the weekend, the job very nearly went to someone else. The formalities began smoothly enough. But behind the facade, there was discord. The result of Walter Mondale's attempt this weekend to dump Californian Charles Manat as National Party Chairman and replace him with Georgia State Chairman Bert Lance. When reaction from party leaders was so fiercely negative, Mondale backed off. Could Manat have been just too good a fundraiser to be replaced? Oil companies, we've learned, make excellent drug money laundering vehicles. Sources told us that this man, Democratic power broker Richard Benveniste, had incorporated a Trinity Oil or Trinity Energy to launder money for his client, Barry Seal. This gray-haired lawyer is the same man who defended Bill Clinton on the Whitewater Committee, the same committee which was haunted by the ghost of Barry Seal, according to the Wall Street Journal. We discovered that back in the early 80s, he represented both Barry Seal and Bill Clinton. We found an oil company called Trinity Energy that was sold by Barry's partner, attorney Michael Roy Fugler, for $22 million to a shadowy company suspected of being controlled by none other than Arkansas kingpin Jackson Stevens. We also traced a Trinity Energy, a Delaware-listed company, to the phone number of a company formed by former Pentagon officials called ICF Kaiser International, whose chairman, a man who had sat on its board for over nine years, was former Congressman Tony Coelho, who resigned from Congress rather than face an ethics probe. Congressional Democrats awoke to even more unexpected headlines today. The number three man in the House leadership, California Congressman Tony Coelho, has also decided to quit. Deborah Potter has our report. It was a stunning surprise. The number three Democrat in the House, Tony Coelho, calling it quits rather than face a protracted investigation of his financial dealings. Today, Tony Coelho was the head of Al Gore's presidential campaign. Why would Gore put someone so tainted in so visible a position? Maybe Coelho's good at fundraising, too. Just how deep does this scandal go? A block off Bourbon Street in New Orleans is Royal Street, since the 1830s home to pricey galleries and antique shops. This elegant gallery belongs to a man named Dave Dixon, known as one of Louisiana's most prominent citizens. An intimate of governors for decades, Dixon is locally revered as the father of the Louisiana Superdome. And for decades, this man, Dave Dixon, was also the CIA handler of the person known as the most successful drug smuggler in American history, Barry Seal. And at the trial of Clay Shaw, the only man ever charged in the murder of our president, Dave Dixon was a character witness for the accused. But the truly saddest part of this whole scandal is the way our free press has looked the other way. They called Seal's killing a gangland-style murder but Barry Seal was not murdered by the Medellin cartel. The cover story that Jorge Ochoa, head of the cartel, caused Seal to be murdered in a contract killing is as much a big lie as anything ever churned out of Nazi propaganda mills during World War II. Incredibly, we discovered that on the night Barry Seal was slain, three other top lieutenants of the Medellin cartel were also murdered. As our lead story, Metro News has uncovered some new information in the investigation into the assassination of Barry Seal. Reporter Dana Kay has the story. 
Metro News has learned that there were a total of four drug-related killings the same day Barry Seal was gunned down here in Baton Rouge. And all of them seem to have been connected to the same drug ring operated out of Columbia. Metro News reported last night that a Colombian named Pablo Carrera was shot and killed in Colombia the same night Barry Seal was gunned down in Baton Rouge by a professional hit squad. Carrera was identified as the number two man in the Colombian drug organization headed by Jorge Ochoa. Metro News has now learned that two other Ochoa associates were shot to death at the same time. Another Colombian, Pablo Achilla, was executed in Colombia, and the fourth Achoa associate to die was a woman identified only as Barbara. She was killed in Miami. Who killed Seal? Just ten days before he died, in a typical display of the fearlessness for which he was justly famous, he threatened to expose the gun running and drug smuggling that flourished in Mena, Arkansas. The man he threatened, then Vice President George Bush. All three of the guys on trial, Richard Sharpstein, the Miami attorney for one of the Colombians convicted, told us, all told their attorneys that once they reached the U.S., their actions were directed by a military officer, whom they very quickly figured out to be Lieutenant Colonel Oliver North. Barry Seal died for a simple reason, a reason which redeems him somewhat in our eyes. He was getting ready to talk. There's more, much more, to this story than we have time for here. It's in our book, Barry and the Boys. And a full airing of the MENA drug scandal can be found in our two-hour special, The Secret Heartbeat of America. You can receive either or both by priority mail by calling the phone number shown at... Promoting the ideas of true freedom and liberty, nonpartisan liberty for all radio with Dave Bourne. Nonpartisan Liberty for All, Nonpartisan Liberty for All dot com. Check out the website. And on every Monday at seven o'clock, the Illumination Hour with host Ellen Stallone, seven o'clock Pacific, ten o'clock Eastern. Um, check that out as well. So uh, a lot of information in those clips, and we're going to talk about uh, some of those. So regarding Barry Seal, and this is, I guess, how I see the um, arrest in Florida and how they dealt with it. The only, I, I searched for, who he actually testified against. The only people he testified against was Turks and Caicos prime minister, uh, I believe. And that was it. And how they could even get them, him in trouble. Uh, I don't know. He never testified against anybody in the Median cartel because they never extradited anybody over, uh, to the United States, uh, except for Carlos uh, later. And as far as I know, he did not testify in his trial. So this whole thing that he was a big, you know, they they lie. If you listen to some of the clips about he was this big informant. What, uh, and I wasn't aware that George Bush was the head of that. It was a DEA special investigative unit that George Bush was uh, the head of. So obviously it was, okay, this is how we're going to get you out of your problem because obviously we don't want to just come out and say, well, he's a CIA asset and uh, tell a Florida judge and risk making that at all public. So what it seems like they did is say, okay, you know, testify against this guy who's whatever, doesn't really matter. And really what they wanted was the pictures that they got. They wanted propaganda on the Sandinista government. They had actually created a department in the State Department called, um, I have it listed somewhere, I have so much information here. Uh, there was a name for it, but it was for propaganda. Because they wanted the American people to support the Contras. 
and what they were doing, the bullshit that they were running. So they had even uh, done that. So with Seal, um, they basically, because you think about it, a drug smuggler, I, I'm not sure how much cocaine he got caught with, but I'm sure it was a lot. And he ends up with uh, either time served or, oh, he's going to, you know, be an informant, which was really just kind of a, bu- a bunch of bullshit to get him out of trouble is is what it was. What happened, though, was a, uh, a Louisiana judge, I guess he was in trouble for something in Louisiana, uh, had something against him or was just a dick. And he supposedly agreed to the Florida deal that he would not do any jail time and it would basically be dismissed. And what the Louisiana judge did was say, oh, you have to be in the Salvation Army uh, thing for six months uh, and live there, but you can leave during the day or between these hours to work or something like that. So he was supposed to he was supposed to agree to it and he didn't, but he still didn't go to jail. So what did happen, though, is the IRS came in because you had all of these investigations going on. And during all these investigations, people were uh, one guy was I think think he was a louise uh sorry an arkansas state police part of the arkansas state police he had he was sprayed with anthrax there were a bunch of people that were killed um we'll go into the train uh killings as well and they essentially anybody with any knowledge was either threatened or or killed of this now they weren't going to you know for the florida arrest that was a little different but as far as anything that went on in arkansas it was taken care of and nothing ever happened nothing came out of any of these investigations that's where bill clinton kind of comes into this and we'll get back to uh barry seal but Bill Clinton was totally aware what was going on. Uh, a whistleblower of the CIA s- said that he attended meetings with Bush, Clinton, Oliver North, whose code name was Something Candy, and uh, I believe Barry Seal might have been there as well. And Clinton had sent his bodyguard on missions with Barry Seal. He also. I think brokered this deal with uh, Dan Lasseter. Now they mentioned in one of the clips, Dan Lasseter, I guess he was a doctor. I wasn't aware that he was a doctor, but I was aware that he was technically selling cocaine. Uh, He had said he gave it away. There was a hearing before Congress and he was saying that his reputation was being destroyed and all of this stuff. And then uh, Congress had asked, uh, somebody in Congress had asked, well, were you not convicted of distributing, you know, cocaine? And he's like, well, I just gave it away and there's a difference. And they tried to make him out like he was a bad guy for giving away cocaine to people. And to be honest, um, he was friends with Bill Clinton. He got pardoned by Clinton. He actually went to jail for a little while, but Clinton pardoned him before he left office. So he was a part of the Arkansas elite at least and got away with a lot of shit that other people wouldn't get away with. But as far as him doing cocaine and if he was selling cocaine or giving it away, which I think it seemed like he was more giving it away. um, He also hired Roger Clinton, uh, Bill Clinton's brother who got arrested as well because the state police uh, actually have a video of Roger Clinton, uh, I think at Dan Lasseter's house. And every time, you know, they would go to his house, he had cocaine. 
Um, I believe Bill Clinton was involved in in doing cocaine as well. But he brokered that whole deal, uh, I believe, with uh, Lassiter um, getting some of that cocaine, which not, I mean, you know, a couple kilos, which actually is a lot for uh, one person that's not a huge drug dealer. I mean, it's not a lot in terms of what Barry Seal was bringing over, but getting part of that. Also, Bill Clinton was... uh, they were laundering money through a firm Lassiter set up. He also set up uh, something with state bonds to give money to businesses or to bring business to Arkansas. But he set that up to launder the money. And from what I had understood, I mean, a hundred million per month was being laundered through Lassiter's firm and also through these bonds and the banks. I don't know exactly how all that worked, but Bill Clinton was involved in all of that. And, of course, he, from doing that, what happens? He becomes president. What a fucking, uh, you know, country this is. Now, again, my issue is not the drugs, and even the laundering of money, because I think all drugs should be legal. It's the hypocrisy and you have and, and, and the lies and the, you know, you're supposed to be part of government. If you want to be part of government, be part of government and obey their fucking rules, which, of course, we know that if you're part of government, you don't have to obey the rules. You get away with whatever you want. But. When it came to um, Clinton, uh, of course, he, you know, did all of this shit and never came up. He never got, you know, he got questioned about it once or twice. Um, But for the most part, it didn't come up when he ran for president. Nobody questions him about it right now with his wife running for president. It's like it didn't fucking happen. And I played a clip yesterday about he totally denies knowing anything about it. And he totally, he was, he was heavily involved to the point where he was in some of these meetings and he knew exactly what was going on. And he was told about it. Um, People demanded an investigation because they knew something was going on. He was told by his bodyguard that there was cocaine on that that's on the plane when he sent his bodyguard L.D. Brown, uh, who I saw on video say that uh, he had told Bill Clinton, well, he's bringing back cocaine. And he just said something. Well, that's, you know, Lassiter's deal, whatever. And he said, well, you know about this. And, And he was like, yeah, of course. So. Clinton was involved in this whole thing. He helped to make sure that no investigations ever took place. Now, he claims he gave $25,000 to either the, I believe, the Attorney General of Arkansas for an investigation. The Attorney General says, we never got anything. We never got any call back from Clinton. Um, He didn't do anything to... Uh, investigate what was going on in Mita, Arkansas. And he suppressed, and who knows what he knew about, you know, people getting murdered. Uh, there were six people that were murdered, not counting the two uh, kids that were killed. That, and this is obvious that Clinton was involved in, in at least um, suppressing this because. He had a coroner that he kept, uh, this, the state coroner that uh, he kept on that I guess had fucked up a bunch of things. And the coroner came back and said these kids, kids were killed by a train and they were high on marijuana. I played the clip from yesterday and mentioned it briefly. So these two kids 
uh, 16 and 17 years old, they had put their bodies in front of a train and made it like they got run over by a train. But they must have saw something at the airport or witnessed something. And it was alleged that actually the guy who was supposed to prosecute them was involved in their murder. Now, I don't know if it was also state police um, or uh, Clinton bodyguards or whoever, but it was people involved in the Arkansas government. There was a claim that they could tie something back to the the prosecutor, um, Dan Harmon, that he was involved in the actual murder of those two kids. Along with that, six other people were killed, whether it was from finding out information or knowing something about the train killing or trying to investigate. Most most of the investigators basically just ran into dead ends where they couldn't get any more information because or their investigations were shut down. So also between 82 and 84, um, well, I should wait until I get to Oliver North, but um, I'll just bring this up now to make sure that I get this in there. Oliver North was working on something that was considered classified, which had to do with FEMA and continuity of government and had to do with implementing martial law and suspending the Constitution. And this was back between 82 and 84. And when they brought this up during the Iran-Contra hearing, someone had asked about it, one of the uh, congressmen. The lead congressperson said, you know, we shouldn't be talking about this because of national security and that, you know, we can talk about it, but it will have to be in a closed session. So he's working on this classified shit about suspending the Constitution and uh, under certain circumstances and stuff with FEMA. So FEMA has been, you know, what we thought it was for years, it, not just recently. Now, I, I mean, all this shit is kind of just out there that um, if you look at all these executive orders, not just Obama that passed them, but uh, a whole bunch of presidents that they can basically... Uh, under certain circumstances, I mean, they can do it anyway because they can do whatever they want, but they can, they made laws to be able to cover themselves that they can legally do it, um, that they can suspend the Constitution and implement martial law um, under national emergencies and all of this stuff. I mean, there's probably like 20 executive orders related to this. But Oliver North also worked on this as well and with FEMA. So uh, don't trust FEMA. Don't have anything to do with FEMA. And remember what FEMA did uh, during the what happened in New Orleans uh, with the, I don't know what they call it, the floods or the it's not called the New Orleans floods, but um, it was referred to as, I don't know what it was referred to, actually. Let's call it, you know, what happened in New Orleans. But, and they did. I mean, they went around taking away people's guns. Um, there's footage of that. So, um, not FEMA, but the military or National Guard. But, um, you know, the fact that that was even had to be discussed, it couldn't be discussed in public. You know, they claim national security for so many things because they don't want you to know that their ultimate plan is to control everybody and everything you do. And part of it was uh, for people that, Allegedly, uh, dissenters, people that don't didn't agree with war. So 
uh, because of what happened with Vietnam and because of what was going on with the Contras. So they wanted to be able to do stuff like that to people that protest a war or if there's dissent or, you know, a, a number of reasons. And I'm sure Reagan, and I believe he did, I know George W. Bush had a bunch of them, um, but in the, you know, the past 20 years, there have been executive orders that have prepared for, you know, if this happens, we can suspend the Constitution, if this happens, and, you know, that's why even the whole FEMA camps, I mean, they might have had FEMA camps back uh, then they might have planned for FEMA camps. And there was a bill by a Florida congressman that was submitted for FEMA camps um, that was never passed, but they really didn't have to. So I don't even know what the purpose of that was, except maybe to get that out there, that um, get it in the minds of people and not in a positive way, in a, you know, we're preparing you for this. And I've noticed, this is a little off topic, but not uh, when it comes to government suspending the Constitution, which they don't follow it anyway, so what's the fucking difference? But I've noticed a lot of movies now where people's emotions are being suppressed, whether it's through medication or in this movie I saw recently, it was uh, they had babies that were born you know basically they created them in a lab whatever and people weren't allowed to touch each other and they were born essentially without emotions but a certain amount of people would start to get them and i forget the name of the movie but it has the girl from um the vampire movies that everybody all the the teenage vampire movies um that I can't think of the name of right now. But um there it, it's weird because usually things happen and this isn't fucking by coincidence in movies that end up happening in reality and it's it's like 9/11 was watch the long kiss good night and it it was so sp- specific to 9-11 now you might have seen that movie and be like what are you talking about well the whole thing that they were trying to hide that was their plan I mean it, it was a small part of the movie as far as them talking about it but basically the whole point of them trying to kill her and what they if you had seen the movie um, what it's about is Gina Davis loses her memory um, she's a. It starts with she's a housewife, and she was found like seven years before that, just uh, you know, passed out somewhere, and they thought she was dead. She was a C member of the CIA, and they thought she was dead. So, what happened was she was in some parade, and CIA agents uh, or somebody who the guy who they had kill her uh, saw her and was like on TV and was like, I killed her and whatever. So what happened from there was they went and tried to kill her and all her skills kind of came back that she had as a CIA agent. And then she started to remember uh, how she was as a CIA agent and all these things. But they were trying to figure out if she had remembered anything and their plan was by a congressman who said we have to stage a terrorist event and it can't be something small. You know, he, I think he even said like 3000 people or 2000 to 3000 people have to die for us to implement all of this stuff to take more control. And this movie came out, I'm thinking 96. So, it's it, it's funny how, you know, movies represent or imitate life and with especially with things 
when it comes to the government. And, and there's a whole bunch of examples, and I've talked about them on a show that I did regarding that. But I'm starting to see those type of movies where people don't have emotions. And like if you've seen Demolition Man as well, they're not allowed to touch. And they didn't make them not have emotions, but they made everybody equal. And that's what this movie was called, Equals, that I had seen. And, yeah, a lot of movies with no emotion and making people equal. And that's basically, you know, it's a metaphor for communism. And that's what's going on right now. I mean, I've talked about the Black Lives Matter platform, which obviously has nothing to do with Black Lives Matter. And, again, your average Black Lives Matter protester I seriously doubt agrees with the platform and and on their signs they have um the website I think it's uh revcom.us or something that's the communist revolutionary website and that's a whole nother issue but they're If you, you know, going from what Oliver North was doing and I look at the Republicans as fascists and the Democrats as, you know, socialists and communists. I mean, there's not a huge difference. I mean, there's many similarities. And I think what um, the way things are going is a combination of of both. But it's just wanting to control people in a different way. I know the definition of fascism is the merger of corporations and government. Um, but it's also, you know, run by dictators and obviously they're controlling all the corporations. And so I don't see uh, a big difference in some ways. And of course the Nazis, you know, it stood for national socialism and a lot of people aren't aware of that. So we look at corrupt governments like this or an example of something that they did. And I had mentioned yesterday, this is about the institution of government. Oliver North, Bill Clinton, George Bush, the names don't matter. They could have been anybody. But people keep focusing on the individuals. Now Trump's the savior to some people. I can't believe uh, somebody like Alex Jones and all the shit he says about the government. Well, Trump's, you know, the savior and all this bullshit. And government is to a point where it's its own corporation and it's too far gone to be able to change anything through the system. And again, it doesn't matter who's in office. So these names and these people, I know a lot of people tend to focus on that. And, oh, we had, you know, corruption during the Reagan years or whatever. And they just look at it that way. But those people aren't in office anymore, so whatever. Or the CIA with MK Ultra. Well, those agents are, I mean, they're probably dead by now because that was, you know, like 60 years ago. Just they're dead of old age. Um, but it's the institution. And the reason why I talk about things like this is this, this is just an, another example of what government does. They're a gang. They're a mafia that does whatever they want to do. They're above the law, but they expect you to obey them and their laws. So getting back to uh, Bill Clinton And the fact that all this shit happened before he became president is even more disturbing. Um, And I, I don't even know what to say about it, to be honest. I mean, it's not a surprise knowing how things are, but it's really fucked up because 
none of this was uncovered or it was, but it just never came out. There, there's no way that, you know, that uh, this wasn't all this shit wasn't known and they pretty much didn't mention it in the uh, government media because he was picked as the guy to become president. You think about it. You you look at the, the convention in 1988 when Dukakis was nominated and Bill Clinton, he almost got booed off stage during his speech. He was an unknown governor of an unknown, uh, you know, not unknown state, but a little state down south, just like Jimmy Carter was. And both were members of the Trilateral Commission and were picked as the people to be president. So, and this whole, the Democrats hate the Republicans, you know, Bush and Clinton were working together on this whole thing. So, um, anyway, the other thing that Clinton covered up, and that would be at minimum that I was talking about, the train um, incident, he would, he at least covered it up. And the guy that was the state um, coroner that did the autopsy said that they were killed by the train. Then when a second autopsy was done, that's when they discovered, you know, the gunshot. I, I think it was a gunshot on one of them and stab wounds and all of this stuff um, when that was performed. And this guy was working for Clinton. Clinton gave him a job, kept him in in his job for the sole purpose of, you think about that, if this is a coroner that's going to examine people and you have him in your back pocket and you control him, uh, you can order people's murders or murder them yourself, I guess, if you want to, and have him say whatever you want him to say. And obviously Clinton went to this guy and said, you know, these guys were obviously hit by a train because there's no way that he's that stupid that he he really believed that and didn't discover any of the other evidence. So at minimum, the minimum amount of involvement by Clinton when it came to that incident was telling the coroner what to say. You know, the maximum is that he was even he was more involved that he knew who killed them, that some of his own people actually killed them, um and maybe some of the other people that had too much information. You know, most of the investigations just got shut down. And of course, he wouldn't you know, investigate it. He said that he would, but, um, you know, he was probably behind the stopping. Once investigations went too far, you know, he was behind stopping those investigations. And Dan Lasseter, I guess, they hint that he had sex with a 14-year-old. He at least gave her cocaine. Um, you know, that... Again, um, he wasn't part of government, and I don't know that selling cocaine to somebody because they're 14, I know. it's um, Giving kids drugs. Well, if you're a teenager, you're going you're gonna to get cocaine um, if you want it. it. It's not hard. But he, they had hinted that he had sex with her and she was a virgin and he, he got her high on cocaine to take advantage of her, which is fucked up. So um, this Lasseter guy, and then Bill Clinton, of course, pardons him before he becomes president as he pardoned his brother as well. So that was pretty much Clinton's involvement and I'm sure he made a lot of money off of this as well 
Now, there was somehow, and I'm not clear on how they were connected, but Rose Law Firm was where Hillary Clinton worked, and there was something with the, the I think he was the owner or partner, Webb Hubble, and that name had come up. And I'm not sure on the details of that, but he was involved in some shady stuff. And I don't know if it was with Dan Lasseter, which I I think it may have been, or any of the cocaine stuff. But I don't really have enough information to speak in detail on that. But you know, it, it seems like Hillary was always involved in fucked up things as well. Also, it's, it was estimated that 75% of the cocaine, I guess, coming into the U.S. passed through Mina Airport. Um, so there may have been other planes that once it, you know, hit Mina Airport. Again, I don't know how the distribution worked, but... 75% had passed through um, Mina Airport. So regarding Barry Seal, things continued to go on um, until he threatened, that was true, um, that he called George Bush as he had his number and said, you know, the IRS investigated him and took away a bunch of uh, his stuff, uh, money and other things. And he called Bush and said, you better call off the fucking IRS. You know, he told the IRS, hey, we work together. You know, I work for the CIA. And I said, well, we're the IRS, so whatever, and took a bunch of his shit. So he had called uh, George Bush and said, if you don't do something about the IRS. I'm going to go public with this shit. I guess he was also even talking about making a movie. And if it's true that he was a CIA agent going back to his 20s, he had plenty of information. I mean, possibly information about the Kennedy assassination, um, Vietnam. I mean, the list goes on. And he had kept supposedly tapes he had tape recorded everything as i mentioned and kept all this information in his cadillac and the louisiana state police at least one of the officers had come out and said the the whole trunk was ransacked they took a bunch of stuff out of it which was probably whatever evidence he was uh carrying around although they did still find some stuff i'm not sure exactly what they found i know they did find uh, Bush's direct number was one of them. Uh, But the government media was wrong about, they said, you know, the amount of people that involved, there were eight people that were involved. Um, Three of them were actually convicted and the way that they found them, it just seemed like a total setup. One of the guys had told his lawyer that he worked for Oliver North as well. So it was, it got to the point where they said, okay, this guy knows too much. Um, We got to get rid of him and we'll just blame it. We'll bring in Colombians to do it and we'll blame it on the cartel and say that he's this big informant and he's going to testify against the cartel. Although it's kind of meaningless, again, because they're in Colombia and unless they get them extradited to the United States, which I think at that point they had reversed the decision. Um, and if they hadn't, they did a little later. But that wasn't something that uh, I think they were worried about. And he had told them that he was going to testify against uh any testifying he would be doing would be against the U S government and all the things that they were doing. So it it, Bush really, uh, had him killed via Oliver North. And it was rumored that Oliver North ran basically a, a hit squad out of his office as well, uh, to take care of, you know, 
anybody that they needed to get rid of. And he might have been behind a few of those um, murders of people getting too close to the investigations. So as I mentioned, all the investigations were shut down. Um, Some people were killed. One uh, state police officer was sprayed with anthrax and almost died. And, you know, whether that was a combination of Clinton and North or mostly Clinton because he would be the one who would find uh, all that information out, being that it was going on in his state. But um, I think one of the reasons why they picked Arkansas was the fact that, you know, they knew they had a, a governor that was corrupt and that, you know, would be totally on board with what they were doing. So they still never charged anybody with the kid, uh, the murders of the kids that were killed on the train. Um, running it really, uh, the guy who really never, I don't even know that he testified before Congress, to be honest. I don't recall him testifying at all. But George H.W. Uh, Bush, I mean, he was the guy, the main guy running this whole thing. You know, he delegated, I think, the a lot of the operations to Oliver North, also the Secretary of Defense and uh, Admiral Poindexter. And the Secretary of Defense was, um, who was the other guy? I have that somewhere. There's just so much information that I I got on this that I um oh when I get to it I'll I'll mention his name as well. But Poindexter was the other one. And I had mentioned yesterday that um Oh, Casper Weinberger, sorry. That uh it makes me think of Revenge of the Nerds because in the movie Revenge of the Nerds, you have the character Poindexter. <laughs> Uh, so luckily for him, Revenge of the Nerds came out, uh, when he was older, so he didn't get teased in, uh, school, although with what he did and being corrupt, he probably deserved it. So those were the main guys I think that testified as well. And that kind of ran this thing. As I mentioned yesterday, you know, they ran every aspect of it, training, arming, you know, all of that stuff. Um, They put mines in the harbors. Uh, They funded them, of course, and they got all the groups to merge. And it did all of that stuff. So I guess to close out on Barry Seal, um, after he died, the organization went on. They still flew cocaine to Mina Um, what really brought things down was the fact that in, um, 19, October 5th, 1986, and Barry Sale was killed in February 86. Um, and really what they wanted Sale for again, they had those pictures, they, they released those pictures and, and they were worried about him getting killed because of that. There were pictures with him um, in Nicaragua and the Ochoa brothers and even Pablo Escobar, pictures of him loading the plane uh, with uh, kilos of cocaine. So they wanted, to, along with one of the Nicaraguan, uh, somebody high up in their government, so they wanted to show, look, the Sandinistas are, look how bad they are. They even, you know, sell cocaine or help. Uh, they're involved with the cartels or whatever. Uh, so in uh, October 5th, 1986, uh, a soldier, Nicaraguan soldier, shot down a plane that was carrying um, supplies to the Contras. 
And that's when everybody found out about it because one of the guys, three died, one lived, and they knew he was working for the CIA and that they that's what they were doing. So they had found out, and from there, that's when the hearings were held and it was all downhill from there. I know that they ended up... Um, it went on till 1990, and then they ended up not taking over, but electing. They threw out the ousted the president, but through an election, the United States had said that they'd lift uh, their embargo or whatever if uh, some the person who ended up getting elected. I don't know the name off the top of my head. Got elected. So they ended up getting elected, and I don't know that they became a free country, but they weren't really a communist country after that president was removed. Um, I don't know what government you would call them now, Um Every government is fucked up as far as I'm concerned, corrupt or, you know, people call the United States free and obviously it's not free. So um, that was the end really for Oliver North and Weinberger and Poindexter and then Reagan was questioned as well, who said, you know, I have no recollection of anything there was also a CIA whistleblower who came out and, and uh, you know, testified about the cocaine and the CIA bringing in all the cocaine. And they still do it today. I mean, they're not doing it with cocaine, I don't believe, but they could be. But, you know, the opium in Afghanistan and whether they're turning it into heroin or not within Afghanistan, I don't know, which I wouldn't be surprised if they were that they're flying in the heroin from Afghanistan to fund the CIA. Now, the CIA, of course, has their own budget that they get, but they want to be able to do all these, you know, operations and covert acts and all of these things. And that gives them a certain freedom from government, kind of like the Men in Black movie where, you know, government didn't even know that they existed and they had made all their money off uh, patents off a few things that they got from were able to develop from aliens <laughs> coming in. So um, that's how they're able to, I think, along with, of course, their own budget, but they have to account for all that, you know. There was so much money that disappeared or that was unaccounted for. And, of course, with all the cocaine coming in, all of these people got paid at the same time. You know, the CIA got all this money from it. They didn't just do it to uh, fund the Contras because they were funding the Contras with money from Iran. So I don't know that any money from cocaine went to fund the Contras, maybe a little, uh, a lot of it. I think went to the CIA and then people like Bill Clinton and his people. And I don't know about Oliver North and Poindexter and the people on the federal level that were involved, if they saw any money from it, but if they wanted to, they could have, but they may have stayed away from it just because they knew it was going on and they didn't want it traced back to them. But Clinton was even involved in the laundering of it. I mean, that's how how much he was involved. So I'm sure he was getting a nice sum from that as well. And, you know, how he was able to file his taxes, which I'm sure were looked at supposedly, you know, when he was checked out running for president, it, you know, whether Lasseter paid him, but I don't know. I mean, they had something going that to look good on the tax returns 
Or maybe it didn't look that good and nobody just questioned it. I don't know. I don't know how much money that he made from it, but I'm sure he made some good money uh, out of it. So uh, essentially, um, as I said, everything kind of ended in 1990 and nobody was charged with anything. Nobody, well, North Poindexter and Weinberger, I believe, were charged with a couple things, but I don't believe they did any serious time. Anybody went to jail for over a year. It might have been one of them, like Poindexter might have went to jail for a couple months or something like that, but it wasn't anything that was serious if you look at what they were doing and what they were involved in. Anybody else that was involved in bringing in that much cocaine would be in jail for life. They would. And even if you look at Barry Seal, how, you know, again, I don't know how much cocaine was on him when he was arrested uh, for smuggling drugs, but anybody else would have got 20 years. So obviously, you know, he was protected because he was, you know, a CIA uh, operative or CIA agent or whatever you want to call him. Um, what it looks like in his case is that he was part of the CIA um, way before Iran-Contra. So what do we get out of all of this? Um, besides the fact that this is a an example of corruption involving three presidents, three presidents actually in a row, because it was Reagan, Bush, Clinton. Um, and I know nobody's perfect, but this is a far cry from, you know, oh, I, I smoked marijuana when I was younger, or I tried cocaine before, or something like that. You know, people that nobody is perfect. If you look at the background of anybody, you're going to find some stuff. But this is way beyond that. These are guys that are sitting there, not to mention the whole war on drugs. I mean, that makes it even worse. You have Reagan with his war on drugs and you have the minimum sentencing and you have people that are going to jail for years just for being drug users, never mind drug dealers. You have them going after Pablo Escobar and killing him. Now, that's a little different because he did do things where, you know, supposedly he blew up a plane uh, terrorist type attacks uh, were made against the Colombian government. So now I look at that as a guy that was at war with the government, to be honest. But if drugs were legal, it would have been a whole different story. But when it comes down to it, not only is the war on drugs ridiculous but we go back to the concept of self-ownership the government doesn't have the right to tell you what to put in your body but beyond that is this is not an isolated incident this is government this is the institution of government this is not about the specific names and faces and people and this went on then, it went on before that, it goes on after that. But yet, people still believe in the system. They still think if certain people get in, that things are going to change. They still believe in all that shit. Now, all the while... You have government 
taking away more freedoms on a daily basis, passing more and more laws, whether it's on the state level or the federal level. The the federal government really wants to take over because when it comes to the federal government, you have completely no say whatsoever. You could say on a state level, depending on what state you live in, that maybe you can have some sort of influence. I don't think you can because the federal government essentially runs the states as well. They run it through funding, uh, giving them money, funding different things, um, a lot of different ways. But at least, you know, you could say, well, you know, my city or whatever, you can believe that you have some kind of say but the federal government um and this is why they want to run everything and that people want them to run everything because they don't think about this is that it totally a hundred percent takes away any say you have in government because it's just so big it's all bureaucracy and the amount of people that live in the country um it's the corporation, the institution of government that's going to make all those decisions because your one little vote doesn't mean anything. And government does whatever they want to do. And mostly they get away with it because they're all part of their one big corporation of government. So I hope for people who weren't familiar with this, it helps for them to see how hypocritical and how criminal government is. But a lot of people are just going to see it as, well, those were just those people. You know, now we have different people. And those people that we have now are just as corrupt as the people that were in there then. And they're all going towards the same goal, control. And really, the government, to be honest, doesn't even really run the government anyway. You have between corporations, billionaires, and those uh, other entities that I talked about that really run government, the important decisions. But the U.S. has become an empire that feels it has the right to do whatever it wants and do whatever it's to whoever and that they're able to do whatever is best for their own interests no matter who it hurts who they kill and that's pretty much what it is so that's why i continue to bring this up and and try to at least inform as many people as I can that the problem is government in itself. The institution of government, whether you're in the United States or Iran, The issue is government. Now, I'm not saying it's better to be in Iran because it's not. There are levels of of freedom and there are some places that are better than others. But when it comes down to it, government's ultimate goal is control of every aspect of your life. And that is the goal of the U.S. government. And it's coming to fruition if people don't start drawing a line in the sand and standing up. So thanks, everybody, for listening, and we'll be back. Be sure to tune in this Monday for another episode of the Illumination Hour with Ellen Stallone, who's doing great. Uh, I would call it a hit show for my network. (laughs) Um, And uh, she does a great job, very creative and interesting show and very thought-provoking. And she's very talented and a great host. So be sure to tune into that and have a great weekend. Go see Snowden. Uh, Opens uh, tomorrow and tonight. 
uh, there's some special presentations where Snowden will actually be live or on tape in the theater. So if you're interested in that, uh, that's going on too. So thanks, everybody. It's a real and dangerous crime. We will defend these police officers. Listen to police officers' commands, listen to what we tell you, and just stop. The nation needs to realize that when we tell you to do something, do it. And if you're wrong, you're wrong. If you're right, then the courts will figure it out. We don't get to pick the law. We enforce them. But at the end of the day, each and every member is to go home safe. Sometimes the use of force is necessary. You need to comply with the police officer the way the system was meant to be. Comply with the orders of police officers. Resisting arrest is a real and dangerous crime.